Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, July 11th, 2021. This is Deacon Barry Taylor, and we are in Lesson 6. Uh, we're beginning a new unit uh, this Sunday, uh, Unit 2, which is entitled Faith and Salvation. That's Unit 2 from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. Uh, the title of today's lesson is A Gift to Strengthen You. A Gift to Strengthen You. Our devotional reading is taken from Psalm 71, verses 1 to 6, and verses 17 to 24. Our background scripture is Romans chapter 1, and our printed passage or lesson text is Romans chapter 1, verses 8 to 17. Our key verse from the key from the King James Version is verse 16, which is, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Lesson aims from the quarterly or number one, discern the power of God as illustrated in Paul's faith. Number two, affirm the power of God's salvation in family and friends. And number three, pray for the salvation of the world, believing that it is possible. Um, <clears throat> we have a very good lesson today uh, from a familiar passage to many of us. Um, after the, let me just say after the introduction, the quarterly lesson has three major divisions. The first is entitled "Thanking." I'm sorry, thankful for the all-in prayer, and that's covered between Romans chapter one, verses eight and ten. Second division is entitled "Trustful on the Way," that's covered between verses eleven and thirteen. And the third division is entitled Truthful, Do Not Stray, as covered between verses 14 and 17. From the standard, for those of you who use that commentary as well, the title of the lesson is Power of the Gospel. Power of the Gospel. <clears throat> Additional aims very quickly are, number one, identify the groups to which Paul acknowledges his debt obligation. Number two, give one example, each of being ashamed and being unashamed of the gospel. And then that's talking to us. And then number three, create two approaches for sharing the gospel. One for people having some gospel knowledge already. And the other for those with much less or no such knowledge. And there are three divisions pretty much along the same uh, verse divisions entitled power of witness one power of two power of preaching and then three power of faith power of faith we are going to uh, give a little background on the lesson we'll have a brief word of prayer and then we will get into our verse by verse discussion. Um, Paul, uh, at the writing, he, um, wrote this, it is, it is, uh, believed that Paul wrote this epistle, this letter to the church at Rome around 58, uh, AD, uh, during his third missionary journey. It's believed he wrote it from Corinth. He had not yet visited Rome, but wanted to do so. And we know he ultimately did and perhaps not getting there the way that he planned. He was in prison, and he had appealed. Uh, he was had been in prison, uh, and had appealed to Caesar uh, for the trumped up charges uh, against him. Uh, so Paul is is really at the height of his his ministry, uh, and uh, he, he has had great success among Gentiles and Jews alike. Of course, he has suffered a lot as the Lord told him he would in Acts chapter 9 when he called him 
to be uh, um, a, an apostle to the Gentiles among the Jews as well, but uh, specifically to the Gentiles. And uh, Paul has a great passion for uh, the loss. And as, as if, if you know anything about Paul, if you read his epistles, you know that uh, Paul had a great desire to uh, share his faith, to evangelize, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to get to actually produce fruit for the Lord uh, among those who had not heard the gospel. Uh, he did not want to uh, build on another man's foundation, but there were so many uh, uh, Jews and Gentiles who were certainly, cer certainly ignorant of, and if not uh, opposed to uh, the gospel, that uh, the field was ripe uh, for the harvest. And, and, and Paul had a great passion to be doing just that, uh, reaping souls for, for the Lord. So now um, we're going to... We're going to uh, look at our lesson uh, following the outline in the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. Uh, we'll read each passage and then we'll back up and have some discussion verse by verse. But before we do that, let's go before the throne. Our, our Father, we do thank and praise you for, Lord, for blessing us this day, Lord, for your many seen and unseen blessings, Lord, for keeping us in your loving care. Oh, we thank you first and foremost for our salvation. We thank you that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we thank you, Lord, for keeping us in your loving care. And we thank you for your guidance, uh, your, your, your Holy Spirit that's available to us, Lord, uh, to guide us, Lord, to give us the wisdom that we need, to give us the peace, to give us the comfort that we need at all times, Lord, that, and the peace that passes the understanding of this world. Now, Lord, we ask your understanding of this lesson. We pray, Lord, uh, even though it's familiar, that you'd give us new insight into uh, its meaning, uh, how you would have us to understand it, and how you would have us to understand the truths conveyed in this lesson in our lives, Lord. Thank you for all those who have uh, tuned in to hear. We ask the ble your blessings upon all them, their families and their households. We know, Lord, that there's great turmoil in our world today, in our society, Lord, but you have promised, Lord, to uh, give us peace, as I said, uh, in the midst of the storm, a peace that passes understanding, understanding of this world. We just ask for godly wisdom in all that we do, all that we think, and all that we say. And we ask that uh, we would apply this lesson again to our hearts and live it out in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So I said we were going to follow the outline. We'll follow both outlines to the extent we can in both commentaries. I typically use the first, uh, the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. Uh, the first division is entitled, Thankful for the All-In Prayer. Thankful for the All-In Prayer. That's covered between verses 8 and 10. From the standard, that division is entitled Power of Witness. Power of Witness. I'm going to read from the King James Version uh, that passage between, again, 8, verses 8 and 10. And it reads, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit, is preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness uh, how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last by God's will, the way will be, that the way may be open for me to come to you. Okay, well, we're going to back up to verse eight. And again, it reads... First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. Now, those of you who are familiar with Paul's letters or his epistles know that this is a customary greeting to thank, to commend the readers uh, for them, uh, for what God is doing through them in particular, and, um, and then also to extend God's grace and peace to them. 
Now, the only place he didn't do that in the epistle that I remember is the Galatians because he was so upset with what was going on in that church. He got right to the message. But this is his typical greeting. And, and Paul uh, makes a habit of allowing, of letting uh, the churches that he writes to know not only that he's praying for them, but he, he shares with them what he's praying for them. Some of uh, the most beautiful prayers in the New Testament were spoken by Paul. Read the first uh, chapter of, uh, of uh, uh, Colossians. Uh, read Ephesians uh, 1. Uh, beautiful prayers uh, for, for the church by Paul, and he lets them know <clears throat> that he's praying for them. And he's praying, he's thanking God for their faith which is reported all over the world. Now, first of all, we need to understand that <clears throat> this is the church at Rome, which was the capital of the world for all practical purposes at that time. Okay, uh, it was the capital of the Roman Empire. Uh, the saying that all roads lead to Rome was not uh, an exaggeration. They really did uh, in the civilized world and even great parts of the uncivilized world. Uh, so, uh, what had happened in recent history is uh, the once the church was founded, I guess the first church was founded in Rome, and it more, more than likely happened because of some Jews that had traveled back to Rome from Jerusalem that had heard Peter and the other apostles at, at Pentecost, uh, and they started a church there. Again, Paul did not start this church, uh, and uh, the church... Uh, no doubt uh, had some conflict uh, with, uh, the, with the traditional Jews that were in Rome. These were mostly Jews, perhaps, that came back, and they probably uh, added some Gentiles to the congregation, but there was a lot of consternation, if you will, between the traditional Jews and the Christian Jews and Gentiles. Uh, so much so, uh, Claudius... Uh, uh, was was it was coming to his attention and he didn't make a distinction between the non-christian jews and the christian jews so he just expelled them all in 49 AD. he said all of you get out of here so they were all expelled and of course that brought that news traveled uh, far and wide uh, now claudius had died subsequently and the jews were allowed to come back to Rome and at this writing, as I said in 58, I think they came back around 54. At this writing, uh, the church has been reestablished in Rome and it is believed it consisted of both Jews and Gentiles. A little more background than I needed to give there, but let's so, but that's part of the reason that their faith is reported of around the world. The impact that they're making in Rome is having ripples uh, across the Roman Empire. Verse 9. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, is my witness how constantly I remember you. And that is, he's going to go on to say in my prayers. Now, um, he is emphasizing that uh, he's praying in his spirit. This is a... Uh, 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 the, the very he's praying with all of his being, his essence uh, uh, to the Lord. Uh, he's preaching uh, with all of his essence uh, to the Lord. He is not uh, going through uh, rituals like uh, the Pharisees did in, in, uh, throughout the Judea and Jerusalem, uh, just to be seen of men uh, who were self righteous and again just going through the rituals and not having any true, genuine spiritual relationship with God, uh, nor was he uh, being uh, overwhelmed uh, by uh, um, emotion and, uh, and uh, the type of, uh, of uh, uh, pagan worship uh, that was done in those days as well, uh, uh, where they uh, basically thought they were going to be uh, recognized uh, and their prayers acknowledged by much uh, gyration and just and, and just uh, gesturing and so forth so he's saying he serves and that word serve can also mean worships in his spirit 
and in preaching the gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. And we'll say a little bit more about that. It's the good news that Jesus Christ paid for our salvation or our deliverance. We're going to say more about that. Okay. In my witness, his witness, that's his personal witness of how constantly he uh, remembered them. He said, I remember you in my prayers, verse 10 says, at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, uh, the way may be open for me to come to you. Now, Paul is uh, better than a year away from actually uh, coming to Rome. Uh, and as I said, he's not going to come under the circumstances that I'm sure he desired. Uh, but what is he doing? I mean, he is uh, uh, trying to minister uh, via this letter and share the gospel and share his faith and, and hopefully uh, some doctrine uh, that will be helpful for them uh, even prior to his coming. So he's praying all the time, when he says all the time, regularly, okay, for them. And Paul, as you know, prayed for all the churches uh, uh, that uh, he had founded, and I'm sure all others, as I, I hope we, we all do, and, and obviously we, we can't name them all, but I hope we pray when we do that uh, certainly on Sundays uh, and, and at other times that every house uh, that is open in the Lord's name uh, that God would bless the worship service and bless the worshipers. Uh, okay, so now he, he again, he is uh, going to wait for God to uh, prepare a way for him to come to Rome. Uh, he's not going to force the issue. Uh, God is leading him in other directions. Uh, we know uh, God is leading him now to Jerusalem, where he's going to be uh, uh, falsely accused by the Jews, and he's going to be taken uh, imprisoned uh, and so forth. And we know ultimately that's going to lead him back, lead him to Rome. But he's being led uh, of the Lord, as we all should should be. We should not endeavor to take on any missions. Uh, by our own direction without the leading, clear leading of the Lord. So now we're going to move into the second division of um, the quarterly, which is entitled Truthful. I'm sorry, that's not it. It is Trustful on the Way. It's covered between verses 11 and 13. Trustful on the Way. And from the standard, uh, this division is entitled Power of Preaching. Power of Preaching. I'll read the passage from the NIV, and it reads, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may mutually encourage each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, and the King James says, to be ignorant, which is a favorite term of, of his brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so unto now. Prevented by who? Prevented by the Lord. In order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have among the other Gentiles. So let's back up to verse 11 again. And Paul is continuing uh, from the last verse, verse 10, where he says he's praying and, and he's praying that God would open a way for him to get there. He says four. So the four connects verse 11 to verse 10. He's given the reason that he wants God to make a way for him to get there. For he longs to see them. I long to see you. Uh, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Now, this is not necessarily uh, a gift of the Holy Spirit that Paul has the power to give. He, uh, that's not what, I, what he's, he's, he's talking about here, we don't think. But he's talking about some spiritual insight uh, and uh, some strengthening of their faith and mutual strengthening. He goes on to say that our faith will be mutually uh, straight, uh, strengthened 
Uh, he wants to establish them in the faith. He says to the end or for the purpose. Well, that, that's the King James verse. He said spiritual gift to make you strong or to establish you in your faith. You know, um, there are examples in the Bible of how people uh, had some understanding of uh, the truth and the gospel, such as Apollos. Apollos was mighty in, 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 in word. He was a great orator, certainly understood the Old Testament, we believe, but he did not understand the gospel as well as he needed to, uh, to really share it effectively. So you remember Aquila and Priscilla pulled him aside and they explained to him the gospel more perfectly or more completely. And then he became an even more powerful uh, evangelist uh, of the gospel. So again, we want to, to make sure we understand that his, his ultimate goal in visiting them is to establish them more firmly in the doctrine, in the true gospel doctrine. Verse 12, that that is, he clarifies that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Now that is something that uh, we certainly uh, do enjoy uh, and experience uh, in our church lives today, and we should be uh, seeking to do more of that, encouraging others with our faith and being encouraged by theirs. Uh, I, I think all of us are encouraged when we hear about God bringing someone through a great trial in life and in faith. Uh, and, and certainly we, we, we recognize what, what God was able to do for them he is certainly able to do for me. So it encourages our faith, and we are to mutually encourage one another's faith. Uh, and also worship together, praise the Lord together. That encourages uh, our faith as well. Let me just read a <clears throat> little bit from the uh, Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly Commentary on this uh, verse. And it says, as Paul ministered comfort to the church he himself would be encouraged by their faith. Often God's people are blessed by hearing the witness of what God has done for others, especially those uh, whom they know. The testimonies encourage and remind us that God is able to do great things for us also. As I said, this sharing of faith helps believers grow in faith as they serve the Lord together. And that is what Paul wanted to do uh, with uh, the church at Rome. Let's move on to verse 13. And it reads, I do not want you to be unaware, again, as the King James puts it, to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been pre prevented from doing so until now. And, and, and now he doesn't mean immediately, but he's been permitted here for uh, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have among other Gentiles, the other Gentiles. Now, Paul is making no bones, no excuses about what his ultimate mission is. Paul is on a mission and that is to uh, produce fruit. For the Lord, that He might, uh, that He might win souls for the Lord. When He's talking about a harvest here, He's talking about a harvest of souls. The Lord Jesus said, "The field is is white unto harvest, but the laborers are few." And Paul is wanting to get there where uh, there is a abundance of white harvest. Uh, the church, uh, as it is today, even, and I'm really disheartened to say that the church has shrunk even in America over the last several years. Uh, but it has, it, at this time, I'm sure it was a very small group in comparison to the overwhelming number of pagans. Uh, and certainly the, uh, the Gentile elites that of course thought they were uh, too sophisticated to uh, believe in such foolishness as the gospel. We'll say a little more about that. Uh, so Paul sees an opportunity to ground, better ground, if you will, uh, the church, those uh, existing believers, both Jew and Gentile, in their faith, in sound doctrine, and encourage them by his faith and be encouraged by theirs, but also 
to reach the unsaved, to reach those who had not heard the gospel. And Paul was intent on producing fruit for the Lord or, uh, or reaping fruit, if you will, for the Lord among those who did not know him. And he said, he said, as I have among other Gentiles. I mean, Paul had had uh, 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 tremendous uh, impacts on uh, the uh, the Gentiles in, uh, in in Antioch and Corinth and uh, in Ephesus and Philippi. I mean, Paul had had uh, tremendous impact on the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, if you remember, he was more effective in many, many areas among the Gentiles, much more than he was among the Jews. And if we go back to, uh, again, Acts chapter 9, when, when the Lord called Paul after he had blinded him, uh, he said he was sending him to the Gentiles, okay? If we look at Acts, Acts chapter 9, verse, uh, verse uh, 15, uh, it reads, but the Lord said to him, this is Ananias, uh, Lord speaking through Ananias to Paul. The Lord said to him, go for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. Uh, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So he was, he was called by the Lord. And what more is going to be said about this, uh, because because of this calling of the Lord, he is indebted to the Lord, okay, to do this, okay, to witness uh, to the Gentiles and the Jews and kings, and and he he did he did that before all as the Lord uh, commissioned him to do, if you will. And Paul had a passion for again, as I said. Uh, Sharing Christ with those who hitherto or hitherfore had not heard of him. Uh, let's look at Romans chapter 15, uh, beginning at 16, verse 16. That I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore have I a reason to glory in Jesus in the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and around about to Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And he goes on, uh, he goes on. Uh, well, let me just finish here, verse 20. And so I've made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, verse 21, to whom he has not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. So Paul uh, had a, uh, a desire, a great desire to preach Christ where he had not been preached. And of course, God aimed him at the Gentiles in particular. Of course, we know he held his own and, and, and went through many battles with the Jews as well. Uh, and many of them were converted uh, to the Lord as well, to faith as well. Let's move into our last division, uh, which is entitled from the quarterly truthful do not stray. And this section is covered between verses 14 and 17. And from the, from the standard commentary, the last division is entitled Power of Faith. Power of Faith. Reading that passage from the NIV, it reads, I am obligated both to the Greeks and non-Greeks both to the wise and foolish. King James, of course, reads, I am debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians. Verse 15, NIV. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power 
that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews, then the Gentiles. Verse 17, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. Amen. So let's back up to verse 14 now. And again, it's he says, I am obligated or a debtor both to the Greeks and non-Greeks or barbarians. Um, I think it's translated better from the Greek, both to the wise and to the foolish. Now, um, <clears throat> as I said earlier, who was he truly a debtor to? Certainly he, he owed uh, the sharing of uh, the, his faith and the sharing of the gospel to those to to all who do not believe as we all do but God had but his true debt his true obligation was to the Lord that charged him with that uh, with that responsibility with that duty he, he sent him he made him uh, an apostle uh, specifically sent to the Gentiles and he had of course more uh, 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 effect if you will or more um, he was more effective, if you will, among the Gentiles than perhaps any of the other of the 12 apostles. Now, he, he, he did this, there, there are two classes of Gentiles. There were in, in, in the, his world and, and at that time, uh, the Greeks who were the educated uh, uh Greek or Roman or Latin speaking uh, people. And there were the barbarians, those who spoke other languages beside uh, Greek or Latin. And uh, be, they were called barbarians uh, by the Greeks first and the Romans because uh, what they, the, the language, whatever language they used, and they no doubt used different languages, sounded like bar, 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 bar. And so they just called them all, they grouped them all together and called them barbarians. They were non-Greek speaking, uneducated. It came to, to mean that as well. And when Paul says uh, Greek and, and barbarian, uh, he's covering all the Gentiles. Okay, it doesn't matter how sophisticated or educated or not that you are. And then he, uh, some believe, uh, some commentators believe this is a, a coupling uh, or basically another way of saying the same thing to the wise and the unwise, the wise being the Greeks or educated, the unwise being the barbarians. But there could be wise and unwise Greeks <laughs> and wise and unwise barbarians as well. But the bottom line is he, he's covering all of them all of the Gentiles. That's the main point here. And he has a debt uh, that he owes to God and to them to share the gospel, to preach the gospel. Verse 15 says, that is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. Now, he's not particularly speaking to those who already have heard and believe the gospel. He is talking more generally about the non-believers uh, in uh, Rome. Okay, there may have been some that were on the fringes of the church that were uh, not truly committed in their faith. And certainly he would reach as well, but he is warning, he is aiming for those who are um, unaware of the gospel. The good news, remember, Generally, gospel means good news. What it means to us as Christians, it is the good news of Jesus Christ. That Christ came and died for our sins, was resurrected for our justification, and is now seated at the right hand of God, being our our being our advocate. Okay, uh, He came and 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 died that we might have deliverance or salvation, which means deliverance from the penalty from the power and ultimately from the very presence of sin. That is what the gospel means. And that is what Christ, what uh, Paul rather is saying. He was eager to preach to those who were 
in Rome. He goes on uh, in verse 16 to say, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news again of Christ, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. Now, why would you think Paul would have to say he's not ashamed of the gospel? Because those who knew anything of about the gospel knew that it 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 had uh, certainly a lot to do with Christ and his crucifixion and subsequent resurrection. Now, uh, and and when uh, Paul or any other evangelist uh, started trying to explain the fact that Christ was God, but he was also man, and uh, he uh, died on a cross, but was resurrected. Uh, the, the the Greeks and the Gentiles, and certainly many Jews, uh, laughed. I mean, it was foolishness to them. In fact, uh, it, you know, to the to, to the Gentiles, he said the gospel is foolishness. It's a stumbling block to the Jews because it wasn't because Christ did not fit uh, uh, their expectation as to what the Messiah would be like at his first advent, at his advent. They, they certainly weren't probably even expecting more than one. And, uh, but it was, it was foolishness to the Greek to speak about a man who, who was a God and, and, and a God uh, got crucified, and which was the, the, the worst form of, of execution. Uh, but then he rose again and, and, and now he's ascended to heaven. It was just, they just couldn't wrap their minds around that. So, and Paul was persecuted uh, in several ways. I'm going to read just something here, just a minute. This is from the MacArthur Study Bible, and I'm going to be very brief here. This is concerning his being, not being ashamed. He had been imprisoned in Philippi, chased out of Thessalonica, smuggled out of Berea, laughed at at Athens, regarded as a tool in Corinth, and stoned in Galatia. But Paul remained eager to preach the gospel in Rome the seat of contemporary political power and pagan religion. Neither ridicule, criticism, nor physical persecution could curb his boldness. And then he goes on to, to talk about the power, and, and this power being uh, derived from a word that we get dynamite from. Uh, and, it, and, 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 and again, it, it, was, it, 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 it sounded foolish to, uh, to the Greeks. From, we can see that in 1 Corinthians 1.18, but it carried... The omnipotence, the all powerfulness of God. Only God is able to save a soul. Only God is able to forgive and remove sin. So it, it is this this power that uh, it, 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 he says that brings salvation. Uh, salvation again being deliverance or rescue from the penalty. What is the penalty of sin? Eternal separation from God, damnation. I mean, it is, uh, it is unimaginable to be even uh, separated from the love and common grace of God in a place that, that Jesus described uh, so graphically as a place of darkness, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. It is that place that God, uh, uh, that people choose for themselves, that God prepared for the angel, but people choose for themselves by not accepting the free gift of deliverance from that place that God offered by the blood of his own son. Okay, and it says, to everyone who believes. Now, Christ died for everyone. He died for the sins of the world, but only those who believe in that death, that that death was for their deliverance will be saved. He says, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. Well, God gave um, Israel uh, to be his witness nation. Uh, he gave them the distinct privilege, uh, privileges uh, of, uh, and, and gave them his oracles, his word. Uh, Christ's ministry was first to Israel. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, uh, the salvation, and, and actually, 
uh, it was through Israel that the salvation was to come to the whole world. Uh, in fact, we could trace that back to the progenitor of Israel, which was Abraham. Uh, and, and the Lord uh, said that through him and through his seed, all the nations, all the tribes of the world, the families of the world would be blessed. And that, of course, was through Jesus Christ and his salvatory work on the cross. So first to the Jews, then the Gentiles. The church started with Jews at Jerusalem, if you will recall, and then it spread from Jerusalem to Judea and then to the uttermost parts of the world as the Lord commanded before his ascension in Acts chapter 1. So finally, let's move on to uh, verse 17, and it says, For the gospel, again, deliverance, or the gospel, for in the gospel, rather, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous or just shall live by faith. And we know that comes from a back. We'll say a little more about that in a minute. And, and I'm sure others as well. MacArthur says that a better translation is of this is not the righteousness of God, but the righteousness from God. Uh, the righteousness from God is revealed. And, and, uh, and this also can be translated justified or justification uh, comes from God, okay? Uh, and it, it, of course, it revealed his perfect holiness in contrast to our sinfulness. Uh, Christ in the flesh lived out the perfect holiness uh, uh, of, of God. I mean, uh, you remember uh, Christ asking anyone to convince or convict him of any sin, okay? He lived the perfect life and thereby could be the perfect sacrifice for us, the just and the justifier, Romans 3.26. He could be both the just one, righteous one, and the justifier, and his holiness or righteousness was not diminished by him bearing the sins of of, of us who needed the justification or needed to be given a right standing before God. Okay, and then it says, a righteousness that is by faith, we receive this righteousness imputed or justification by faith in what Christ did on the cross for us uh, from first to last, uh, from beginning to end. Uh, and this, uh, our faith is actually passes uh, from one uh, individual believer to another individual believer, uh, and 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 it goes so and and so on. So our faith is passed from one to another, from 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 first to last, and the just or righteousness again that we receive, our, our justification is by our faith. And then he concludes, just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let, 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 let me just say another word about the, the gospel. The gospel tells sinful people how to become right with God. Again, given a right standing for, before God. It is something that can never be earned by our own efforts. We read in Isaiah 64, 6. You know, even our, our, our righteousness is as filthy rags, he says. You know, um, uh, God hath uh, made himself sin who knew no sin. This is the Lord uh, Jesus, the second person in the Trinity, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 2.21. We are made righteous. We are given a right standing. I like to use the word picture, clothed in his righteousness. Uh, we are given a right standing before God our Father because of the righteousness of Christ that has been imputed to us. And again, I was about to speak about uh, the just so live by faith, and that comes from uh, back at 2.4. And the, the original uh, setting of this verse was Habakkuk was complaining to the Lord about the, 
you know, the prosperity of the wicked and, and the suffering of the righteous and expecting action. And, and God's final word to uh, was that his people must remain faithful, trusting him for the outcome that vindicates the righteousness and justice, or uh, it should be vindicates righteousness and justice, his righteousness and justice, I would say. And our job uh, is not to try to compel God to to act in a particular situation. I mean, certainly uh, he, he wants us to pray for our needs, but rather it is to place our faith in God to do the right thing in his timing. Uh, one, of, one of the things I think we have a problem with, uh, maybe not always asking for the wrong things. I, I believe that mature Christians certainly know what to ask for and what not to ask for, uh, not to ask uh, for things that they will consume on their their, their lust. Uh, but the, the, the thing we, we have a problem with is waiting on God to answer in his own time, to respond to our prayer for whatever it is in his own time, recognizing that his timing is perfect and ours is not. You know, we don't know the beginning from the ending, as Reverend Armstrong <laughs> likes to say, uh, but only God does. And so God knows the perfect timing. And of course, uh, we are to live day by day, uh, moment by moment, by faith, by trusting in God, uh, not by sight, but by trusting in God. Uh, and if we do that, we can have the peace of God. Uh, we have made peace as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death on the cross for us and his resurrection for our justification. We have peace with God. We can have the peace of God as we just trust him and wait on him and live and walk by faith. So we pray that we've, gotten a little more insight uh, uh, from this passage today. We thank you all for listening and we will close. Uh, we, Lord Jesus, we do thank and praise you for again another opportunity to study your word. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to live, to walk by faith, Lord. Walk uprightly before you're doing those things always that are pleasing in your sight. Lord, in, in the peace that passes understanding that you will give us as we trust in you in everything and for everything. So until such time, and we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Until such time as we shall meet again, may God bless and keep you.